sometimes it's hard to find advisors that are willing to come up here and, and speak about what they're doing. Uh, sometimes people have great stories, they just don't feel comfortable speaking. However, Promote, I know I spoke to Kalu a year and a half ago about this exact topic. Um, I've known him, I guess, about three years now. His background is that he's an actuary, which, don't be scared, he's not one of those kind of actuaries <laughs> that, that can't actually explain what the heck he's talking about. He's got that rare combination of extreme technical ability and knowledge. He can actually take complex structures and communicate them into a simple and easy to understand idea type way of doing it. Um, he was on the pricing side at a major insurer. He left the comfort of the insurer side of things uh, about three years ago. He's gone off on his own where he's now building a practice as a fee-for-service insurance analyst for high net worth clients. Uh, and he also works with other professional advisors as well. So he actually puts together the analysis and if if the advisors want, or if the clients want to implement those ideas with other people, that's fine. If they want to do it with him, he discloses the commissions and the value, that type of thing. Uh, where he's built his business is primarily through social media uh, because he was a head office guy that moved into the field. So he's, he's, one of the, he's one of the guys that when I get his newsletter every month, I actually read it because uh, I don't think any of you are at a shortage of getting e-newsletters, uh, but there's a lot of them that you get. You don't always have a chance to read them. The ones I do are the Harvard Business School one, Wharton Business School one, and Promotes. Uh, that's my own personal endorsement of it. Um, it. It is an interesting newsletter because it's not just pure actuarial marketing stuff. It's actually interesting marketing ideas, business ideas, life ideas that, that are in it. And with that, I'll turn it over to Promote on how he actually Build the ideas that he wants to communicate and communicates them to his target clients. Wrote. How would you feel if you saw something like that at the beginning of my presentation? How would you feel if that was the case, but you didn't know until afterwards? That would be an issue, right? So this disclaimer that I have is that what I'm sharing is based on my own experiences, things that I've done for a number of years, because uh, I've also been helping advisors with their own marketing. And so these are things that are field tested. And what I wanted to do was, because our time is limited, was focus on LinkedIn, as Matthew was saying, so that when you leave, you have things that you can actually implement today. Now, are you looking to do any of these sorts of things? I'm assuming you are, otherwise you wouldn't be here unless you just had to get CE credits. <laughs> Trust is a big factor in, doing the, in achieving the goals that we have. And the challenge is that the financial sector is the least trusted in the world, once again. Now, there are exceptions, of course, but this is the kind of stuff that people read from, from credible sources like Edelman, that the financial sector is just not an area that you can place much trust in. And we saw from Matthew this morning some ways that you can build trust. And we'll be looking at how LinkedIn is a good tool in that process. So it's not, that the, it's not a question of whether the glass is half full or half empty. The glass is broken. And we cannot fix the entire sector on our own. But we can do things so that we stand out from the perceptions that people may have about the whole sector. And so when trust is running on empty, then that's not very good. But the, the thing to remember is that at the center of trust is you. And that's the area that you can do some work to make sure that you are able to stand out. And the actuarial motto comes to our rescue. The actuarial motto says that the work of science is to substitute facts for appearances and demonstrations for impressions. And I always have trouble with that because it's just a little too complicated, but there are two key words in this. One is facts and the other is demonstrations. Now, a fact is a verifiable truth. And a demonstration is a display of proof. And there's one ideal place where you can have both of these working for you together. And it's the only place I know where you can have the two, and that is LinkedIn. It is the core of your marketing. So when you're using LinkedIn to build trust, what you're doing is not just putting really boring things there, but you will have some boring elements. You're putting things that are marketing oriented. So it's more of your marketing profile. And as far as the verifiable truths go, what you're putting there is your resume. So this is 
where you went to school, the things you studied, etc., where you worked. Uh, and so that's part of it. And the other part of a verifiable truth is a testimonial. And testimonials are the best proof that we are good at what we say we are good at. And I know that we say that we're good, but if someone else says it, uh, then it actually means something. And the great thing about LinkedIn is that you can't fake the testimonials. So if I were to, I mean, people who have testimonials, like sometimes you think that they must have written them themselves. And the thing with LinkedIn is that, say for example, if Matthew or Chris wrote a testimonial for me, and I wrote testimonials for them, then you would be able to see that. And if they were both done on the same day, then you'd say, hmm, there's something funny going on here. And in essence, it would cancel out both of those testimonials. So I don't actually like to write testimonials for people that write testimonials for me, because it in essence reduces the value of what, they're, what they've said. But I do see many people who don't seem to have that compunction, and so they've got these testimonials, but it's basically from people that they work with in some capacity, and that takes away from the credibility. For the displays of proof, what you can do there, and this is something that's done on an ongoing basis because trust is not something static where you've done it once and then people trust you forever. It needs to be perhaps daily, weekly. So displays of proof can be status updates that you place on your LinkedIn profile, and it can also be in the form of activity in groups. So if you look at the verifiable truths, that's historical, that's old stuff. So this is what you did in the past. It doesn't mean you're any good today. Maybe things have happened in your life. Maybe you've just got stale. Lots of things could have happened. The displays of proof that are taking place today show that you really are still what you were, and ideally that you are better than you were before, that you, you're on some type of arc, which is showing that you're improving. We're also judged by the company that we keep. And LinkedIn is the place where people will show whether they are willing to be associating with you in a public environment. So if you have some good high caliber connections, then that instantly raises your credibility. And when you reach out to connect to someone else, chances are they will look at your profile unless you send the generic invitation, which is not the best thing to do, but you send a, a customized invitation, they'll look at your profile, they'll see who they know in common, and if it's prominent people, then in essence, you've been endorsed by them. There's a greater chance that they will then connect to you. And I'm assuming in this presentation that people are reasonably familiar with LinkedIn. If not, you can just go to LinkedIn or Google it and get more information. But in your profile, there, there are different pieces of information that are shown. So there is a place that you can put a, a slogan of sorts. So the one I'm using is Actuary Advocate Blogger. Then you show where you're working now, where you worked in the past, where you, where you were educated, the recommendations you have, those kinds of things. And then links so that people can find you. And the recommendations are very important because this is showing people who will vote for you in public. Right? Because when you talk to people, they say, well, hey, you're great, whatever. But will they actually put it in writing? And I hate it when I get things in emails. I mean, I like it that people are saying, hey, you've done something really great, etc. I can't do anything with that. Because if I were to print those off and put it on some page and put it in some kit, then there's a suspicion that that's been edited or tailored. If it's on LinkedIn, the testimonial does not reside on your LinkedIn profile. It lives on theirs. They are the ones who wrote the words. They are the ones who can change the words. They are the ones who can remove that testimonial anytime they want. And so that adds a different level of credibility. But it's important as advisors when trust is low, to have people who will say that we are good at what we say we are good at. It just simplifies our business. And LinkedIn will send you a weekly update to show you what is going on with your network. So you will see whose profile has changed. And what you can do in that case is congratulate them. So for instance, uh, I noticed that one of my Connections is now an, is an accountant, an accountant, so they are good centers of influence. But now he's an executive member of an advisory group. Well, that's something that's worth congratulating him on. And what I've noticed is that something as simple as congratulating something, uh, congratulating someone on something they're proud of, goes a long way because I find that I am often the only person out of all their connections who took the time. 
And it doesn't take any time to say congratulations. And I might say a few more words. So little things like that are valuable. And not only does that person see it, every person that they are connected to also sees that. And some of those people may be interested in knowing who this person is that they don't know who has congratulated someone that they do know. And then they may look at your profile. And when they look at your profile, you may be able to see who they are. And when you see who they are, maybe you look at their profile and maybe you send them an invitation. And I find that in virtually 100% of the cases when someone has looked at my profile, if I send them an invitation, they accept. They're almost honored that I took the time to go and look at them. Because maybe they wanted to connect to me, but they didn't think that I would connect to them. So all these, and this is just from a weekly email that LinkedIn sends you. So if you don't have time to use LinkedIn every day, just look at this email, see whose profile has changed. Take a look at which new people are connected to your connections. And then maybe reach out to some of those people. You have a better chance of connecting to them because you have at least one person in common. And the other thing is that you'll see what your connections have been doing on LinkedIn, what sort of updates they've been posting. And again, when someone posts an update, they are looking for attention. And most people don't take the time to acknowledge the effort that someone has taken to post a link to something that they think will be of value to other people. So all you have to do is click on a like button, and then your network is informed of that update. Their network is informed of you. If you want to do something that's a little more sophisticated, you can add a comment. So maybe you thank the person for posting that update or you add something of value to that. And then all of a sudden their network sees that. And then some people may add additional comments, but you're showing an example of your current level of thinking, your current level of expertise. And it's, it's free. You see what they're doing, but if you are doing things, then they see what you're doing. Right, so every time you post something or you like something or you comment or you do something in a group, your entire network is informed of that. And in my case, I try to do something on average once per day. Maybe in your case, you decide that once a week or twice a week, you will do something. And then all these people see that. And then they can like that, they can share it. But what you're doing is that you're showing that you're still alive, you're still there, you're still looking out for them, you're still doing things. And sometimes, maybe this has happened to you, you get a call because they just remembered you and rather than them taking the time to think of other people, they decide that they'll just call you because you're top of mind. The other thing is that on LinkedIn and in social media in general, it's very hard to fake because you can measure your progress and total strangers can measure your progress too. So you can say that you're really amazing and you do this <coughs> and you do that, but with a quick Google search, people can see whether that's true or not. And there are a couple of uh, different things that we can look at, but something that's within LinkedIn that is something that only you can see is how many times your profile is being viewed. So there's a running average over the last 90 days. So this is as of about a week ago when I uh, finalize this presentation so it could go for CE accreditation. So over the last 90 day period, I showed up in searches 4,312 times. So this is people on LinkedIn who are searching for something and then I showed up for whatever reason. And here's a hint, if you have very little content in your profile, you don't show up very often. So if you take the time and you put lots of information there, I'm not saying necessarily try and think of clever keywords that people may be searching for, but just to have sensible content, then people will be informed of you in the searches. And so of those 4,312 times, there were 285 people who took the time to look at my profile. Now you could say, well, that's only 7%. That's not really much. Like it should be at least a thousand people. It should be 2000 people, but 285 isn't bad. I used to actually get a much higher response rate. It would be between 15 and 25%, but they weren't really the right people. So I actually took steps to take content out of my profile so that I would not show up as often because I had things related to being involved with social media, et cetera, that just attracted people. And so I'm getting a higher quality of person who is now uh, taking the time to look at my profile. 
And as I said earlier, they may not send me an invitation to connect, but if I send them an invitation, they almost always agree because they are the ones who came to me, right? They were doing a search, I showed up, they looked at me, maybe I wasn't what they were looking for, so I'll send a, a nice email saying, uh, thanks for looking at my profile. I guess I'm not the person that uh, that you were looking for, but I looked at your profile and, and uh, dot, dot, dot. So if you'd like to connect here, we can, smiley face, right? And so it's, it's light, and then people will generally agree to that. And then each person that you add to your network, and this is counter, some of the things I'm talking about are counter to what LinkedIn tells you to do, because they tell you, you, you really shouldn't connect to people you don't know. But to me, that's the whole point because I already know the people I know. I'm trying to find more people. And so the people I know, each person I know, helps me reach out to another person. Because I'm often offering very specialized services, I need to be known by a large network so that when a need arises for four fee services, then they think of me. So you get this, and then you also get statistics over a shorter period of time. So in a three-day period, as of last week, in three days, I showed up 70 times and nine people looked at my profile, and that was about 13%. So the numbers do vary a lot, but you can see what is going on, and if you're not happy with the results, then take some steps to improve them, because you get this kind of information all the time. And what I'm doing is I'm simply using the free LinkedIn account. If you use the paid account, there's probably more things you can do. I don't find that there's a need for that. You may decide that there is. Another thing about LinkedIn is that as you build your connections, you may not understand the connections among your connections. LinkedIn has a feature, again, all this is free, called a LinkedIn map, where they analyze all of your connections, depending on how many you have, it can take a few minutes. It's not one of these instant things where Google gives you the answer even before you finish typing it. This is something where they're analyzing it. But you can see where your network uh, how it, how it looks. So for instance, I have four different clusters. There is a cluster, I'll just call it A, which is a particular group. B is an area that I wanted to have more connections in, but I've been working on that for a couple of years. It's just very slow. Uh, for whatever reason, it's just not a, a sector that seems to want me to get involved in it, but I think I'm going to keep trying that. C is a very concentrated sector where I got involved with the people in that sector within a period of a few months. But what I noticed is that those people are not connected very well to anyone else. So it's almost like a trap that you get in there and you get to know these people, uh, but they're not of much use in terms of helping with other things. And D is the area that I, I focus on and I've been making good progress there. So these are things that I could not have told by just looking at my connections because there are hundreds of them. But these are things that I can that LinkedIn will show you. So there's good information that you can get directly from them. And as far as public report cards, people can check you out on services like Clout and Trust Cloud and see whether you're any good. And even if you don't want people to check you there, they can. It's not something where you have to give permission for someone to see whether you are what you say. They can just do it with a Google search. And so Clout is a tool that measures influence. And my score is 52 out of 100. I don't know if that's good or bad. It's really a question of how it is relative to my peer group and competitors. And I think in that group, it's relatively good. If I'm comparing with Obama or Justin Bieber, then I guess I'm a loser, right? But they're not part of my network. I don't. I'm not striving to be 90 or 100, because if I were achieving levels like that, I'm probably not doing any work. Because I have to do things too, so I just can't be posting updates all the time, because you get credit for the things that you're doing. And so anyone can go and look at your cloud score. Uh, but this depends on LinkedIn and Twitter, et cetera. And if you're not there, then guess what? You don't, do, you don't get a cloud score. And that's much worse than having a low score. Because we're trying to show that we're innovative, we're up to date, we're helping our clients. And if we're not using tools that have been around for years that hundreds of millions of other people are using, well, maybe that suggests that we're not quite as fresh and sharp as some of our competitors are. Now, you may not agree with those assessments, but people have very limited time. 
they have different ways of looking at things, and they may decide that these things are good or valuable. There is skepticism about the quality of the cloud score, whether it really is good or whether it is bad. The point is these things improve, and it is there, and it is being used. There's a measure of trust called Trust Cloud. This is relatively new, and this is like a credit score where people can just see where you rank on trust, and this is out of a thousand, so 745 is considered good. Now here, you get credit for things like being an influencer, which means that people actually pay attention to stuff that you do. You get credit for being a long timer, which means that you've been sharing things for years and you get credit for being a connector, which means that you bring people together. And so those are good things to be good at anyway. Again, the algorithm is not perfect. Uh, I like it because it's saying at least I'm good rather than putting me at 10 out of 1,000. But people can look at you on these kinds of measures. And if someone is good at a measure like this, they can raise that as a competitive point. Okay, so you're thinking of dealing with this person. Well, I don't know, I just checked them out on cloud and like, they're 12. Like, do you even know what that means? Like, I mean, like, why aren't they at least uh, 30 or 40? You can do things like that. Uh, we'll take questions uh, in a little bit later in the session. Uh, and actually, we'll have a lot of time for questions, because I find that if it's just me talking, I already know what I'm going to say. I'm recording it anyway. I could record without an audience and just put it on YouTube. The real value comes from the questions that you ask. So if we look at your next steps, LinkedIn offers you a lot of benefits. First of all, you get traffic. There are people looking for someone like you pretty well at any time. And if you're not there, well, they'll find someone who is. Right? So you're not spending a penny, but people are, like there's traffic that you can access. The same rules apply for everyone. So it's not like advertising where people who have more money can get more coverage. Here, the rules are the same for everyone. The people who are fake get spotlighted, so you can easily tell who they are. And so you'll find things that they don't have credible connections. They may be connected to a lot of people, but they may not be good quality people. You can also see that they may not have credible testimonials. You'll see some people who have dozens of testimonials, 30 testimonials, 50 testimonials, but you read them and they just don't look real. You say, well, this person is the best and I hire them for everything. Those kinds of ones, so you figure they must be paying people. And then you look at those very same people and you see that they've given no testimonials to anyone else. So they don't have a kind word to say about anyone else, but they've got all these people saying they're amazing. Mm, doesn't seem right. And you can see who these people are. And another thing is you can see whether they are generous. Because in social media, the idea is to share things of value on an ongoing basis and you can't fake generosity for long. So maybe you start doing something, but then you stop doing it. The consistency isn't there, the generosity isn't there. Uh, your scores drop in the different measures. Also, you get the analysis. We looked at the LinkedIn maps and the traffic over 90 days, number of connections, etc. And LinkedIn is optimized for Google. So if someone types your name into Google, then LinkedIn may be the first thing that shows and that can be handy, especially if there are other people who have a similar name. Like I have the fortune or misfortune of having the same name as a president of a Fortune 500 company. But I show up before he does because he's probably busy working and I'm using social media. And all of this is free. So you're not spending a penny to get these kinds of results. You've got all the tools that you need to do everything that you've seen here today. There's nothing that you need Apart, I'm assuming you have a computer and an internet connection. Uh, apart from those things, that's all you need, and maybe a little bit of time to think. This you might want to write down. Uh, here is a 30-day action plan that you can start either today or tomorrow or, or next week. And it has three different categories. And again, this will be posted online, so if you don't want to write it down, though there aren't a lot of words here, you can go and, and uh, download it afterwards. In your LinkedIn profile, we'll look at three different areas. One is your past expertise, and here, over the next 30 days, get at least three testimonials. So three people who say that you are good at what you say you are good at. And also, complete your profile to 100%. LinkedIn has this bar which shows you how complete your profile is, and 
if it's not at 100% right now, then just take some time and complete it. It's really boring to do, because it's just adding stuff that you may not really want to do, but it's all about you, right? You only have to do it once, and when you do those things, then you increase your chances of showing up in searches. So it's a one-time investment. So that's historical. Then for ongoing generosity, give at least five testimonials. When I'm looking for someone who I think is a good person, I want to see that they've received three testimonials saying that they're good, but I also want to see, more important than that, that they're generous, that they are willing to go on the public record and say good things about other people. And that's where a lot of people fall down. They want people to say that they're great, but no, it's too risky. I can't recommend that person because of whatever reason. But you want people to recommend you. Hmm. And another element of ongoing uh, generosity is to post at least two updates every week. So maybe you pick two days of the week, say it's Tuesday or th and Thursday or Monday and Wednesday, whatever it happens to be, and it can be more than two days, but let's say two, because I want something where it'll be practical for you to do. In a period of about 10 minutes, you can probably find a link to something that you have read that would be of some value to your network. So just post that link. Nothing magical will happen in the beginning, but what will happen is that over time, as the weeks and months go by, you will be recognized for your consistency. And that will have a lot of value. You'll be top of mind because people will keep seeing you. And then to show your current relevance, so this is showing your level of current thinking, that you're still sharp, etc. participate in groups. There are groups of all sorts. And the big mistake that people make is that they join groups of their competitors. So trade groups, etc. So they're all busy showing how smart they are to people who are never going to buy anything from them. That's good for education, but since your time is limited, maybe you want to limit how much time you spend there. You want to participate in groups where your prospects are. Right? You want them, your prospects, to see that you know stuff. You don't want to show that your com your competitors how much you know. They they don't really care. And you'll generally find that not many other, many of your competitors are following that simple strategy. And so if you're consistent, maybe you participate in a group, say, once a week, then you start getting known there. So you start answering questions that other people have asked. You start raising your own questions if you want. And then the last element is to create original content. So this shows your true expertise, where you're not just commenting on other people's stuff, you're actually creating your own. And a very simple way to do this is just to post an update where uh, you write a few hundred characters and that then goes out to your network. So in a sense, that's like a very small blog post, something that's extremely effective because if you say things, it's not as credible as if, say, a Harvard Business Review or Wharton says something. So if you come across a good article in a reputable publication, say the Globe and Mail or or some publication like that, Wall Street Journal, that you think is relevant. Maybe it's an article saying that people need to buy more insurance. I mean, if you write that, who's going to believe you? Right? Self-interest. But if there's an article in a credible publication saying that people are not buying enough insurance, they should be doing this and this, then you can post a link to that, but then you can also add your additional comments. So for instance, this article may be focusing on life insurance, and maybe you add that life insurance is important, but it's even more important to have living benefits, because that helps even if you don't have beneficiaries. So something that shows your expertise, or this, this is what happens in the US. In Canada, we have even better advantages because of the way the regulations around insurance work. So that way, you're, you're adding your expertise without spending a lot of time. Now, just as examples of some of the things that have happened to me because of the simple things I've been doing, uh, I've been in the Toronto Star, uh, I was on the Globe and Mail talking about disability, uh, I was on an internet television show called Liquid Lunch. Uh, last month I was interviewed about how I invest, which is actually quite boring. They act, uh, the Globe and, and again, this is people coming to me, not me going out to people saying, would you please take some time and interview me? The Toronto Star one is probably the best example because the reporter said, uh, do you want to have your photo taken now or after the interview? I'm thinking, well, okay, let's talk first because by the time we're done, you may realize you'd just be wasting your photographer's time. And what Cynthia said is no, 
I've checked you out online. You are the one I want to talk to. Now, I could have messed it up by not having anything to say, but I had already established enough trust based on things that she was able to find with a simple Google search. So all I had to do was then verify that I was that person. And this was a similar thing where I was contacted by the Globe and Mail four years ago about how I invested. And at that time, I gave them answers, and I guess it was too boring because I wasn't doing all the, inside, the exciting things that other people were doing before the markets didn't respond the way that their strategy suggested. But I got contacted again, and this time, I did get published. I saw this in a video yesterday where I didn't even give permission to be filmed, but I guess I'm so famous that I'm a celebrity. And this just happened exactly one week ago. And so all these things I'm showing you, because there are some people who try to be authors in publications, that works and that's time consuming. A much better and simpler and more effective approach is to be interviewed in publications instead. Now this is an example where Rob Carrick has a weekly personal finance reader. And in Canada, we don't pay attention to this, but in the US, this is the most important month of the year for insurance. It's like Insurance Awareness Month. So they, they have public service announcements, insurance companies are promoting it, etc. Canada, for whatever reason, we don't do anything. So I basically just take the US stuff, which is very well put together, and I just write a blog post about it. What happened here is that in Rob's search of the best of the web, he, because this year's spokesman is the cake boss, I wrote a blog post, so he had a link to that. So when people click on this, then they go to my blog post. And this is exactly one week ago, and already this blog post is my sixth most read blog post ever. And that's just because of this traffic that I got from a very credible source. Now the question that may come up is, what does all of this cost? And the answer is nothing. There is no cost to any of these things. There is nothing at all stopping you from doing any of these things. You can do exactly what I've been doing. Now, the other element is what is the benefit? If you're getting attention in major publications or you're getting attention by peer groups or, or centers of influence, then what is that worth to you? And all these things are just there for you to use and you can do this all on your own. If you find that that's something that's overwhelming, then you can probably find someone you trust who can help you with it. But within a period of a month, you could be much further ahead than you are right now. And it's not like we're sitting in front of prospects from morning to night. There are times of the day when we are not doing that, and those are really good times to invest some time and do things to help us be more successful on LinkedIn. We'll now have our discussion, and if Chris could just tell me, say, five minutes before the time is up, then we'll all go to the wrap-up. So yeah, we've got about 10 minutes. Okay, questions, please. Who would like to ask the first question? Yes. Any advice? Um, I get requests from people that I know to recommend. Uh, might be a friend I haven't seen in years, and he's in some industry. Can you recommend me? Um, first question, is he directing that potentially when people ask for recommendations? a broad sweep of all of their contacts. Can you do that? And secondly, have you been in that situation where you kind of tactfully, you know, like I've never done business with some of these people, how do I recommend them? I can say, yeah, you're a great guy to appear with on Thursday nights, but you know, the real estate agent or whatever, I've done them completely. Yeah, LinkedIn has a whole recommendation engine. So as you complete your profile to 100%, one of the steps is to ask for recommendations. And all you have to do is select a bunch of people and then a generic email will go out. Uh, but it's not good to send out generic emails. You can actually personalize that and send it to selected people. And then they can choose to respond or not. When it comes to me giving recommendations, it has to be someone that I can recommend because I've established a certain level of credibility and I have to be careful about preserving that. So I can't just give recommendations to everyone who asks. I had a situation recently where I had an opportunity to speak to a group through someone. And then a few weeks before the event, that person asked me for a recommendation on LinkedIn uh, for work that I had no familiarity with. And I politely declined saying that I maybe later, but at this point I can't. And then that same day, I was no longer speaking at that event. 
So the fact that I didn't give the recommendation was actually a good sign of what that person was about. But you have to use your judgment because you are being measured by your recommendations. And so I'm very selective about them. Yes. You mentioned the cloud and trust cloud. Do you register for those or how do you appear on? Well, on what cloud does is it just looks you up anyway. And so if someone goes there, basically it's based on Twitter. So if someone goes to cloud and they type in your Twitter address, then a cloud score will show up. It will be higher if you register on cloud because then you can connect your other accounts like your, your LinkedIn and Facebook and other things. Uh, but there will be a baseline score. Trust Cloud is relatively new, and so there they haven't quite done that, but I would anticipate that would be one of their stages. You can take that trust badge and you can put it in different places to show people there's some level of trust in you. Uh, but right now you can't just type in someone's name and have a, cloud, have a trust score, but that's probably coming over time. Yes. Um, also too, it may not apply to yourself, service but you know for many of us who have uh, MFDA licensing relationships with certain suppliers compliance is an issue and I know on LinkedIn there's many suppliers that uh, you know, very specific with what you're saying on LinkedIn um, they ask that to go through their compliance department um, any any uh, experience with that any advice anything that you brought up well uh, you do need to follow whatever compliance guidelines apply in your industry. Like they're very big institutions that have lots and lots of money. They can buy billboards, newspaper ads, etc. They basically muzzle their advisors from using social media because they want everything approved, etc. So the people who have all the resources are barred from using the tools that people are now using today to connect, show personality, etc. So the and the funny thing is that the people who can use these tools tend to not use them. So, I mean, you have to make sure that you're within the guidelines and maybe over time there will be more leeway. Uh, but the fact that compliance is there is showing that these organizations or groups don't trust the advisors, right? So what you want to say, if you talk to someone privately, that's okay. But if it's going to go on the public permanent record, then they don't trust you to say that. And so that's an interesting observation. Why are those restrictions there? So they may ease up over time as companies see that business is being lost because their advisors are not able to interact. I had a very nice testimonial from someone at a national account and he was told by management that they're not allowed to say nice things about people who don't work at their institution. Right? So it's just a corporate policy. And so that taints the recommendations they give, but at the same time, you think, okay, so what are you getting for these sacrifices you're making? You're giving up your personality something that's very powerful in social media to work for another brand. And one final question. Yes? So you talk a lot about linking into other connections on your LinkedIn. Do you also recommend instead of connecting to them, connect them via more like a personalized handwritten letter or something that says, you know, you know, you kind of confirm like one of your friends will say, you're my friend, I say, you know, you have about five contacts here. I really think would be beneficial to our services. Is it okay if I send them an actual handwritten letter so we're connected through LinkedIn? And then it reciprocates them coming to your LinkedIn instead. So I uh, would just send you an actual handwritten type letter or something that kind of triggers more something out of the box. It's not so social, but it is still connecting. Yeah, there are lots of different things you can use and handwritten letters are probably an excellent idea. With my handwriting, it would actually not work in my favor, but if your handwriting is good, then that could be, it, it would certainly set you apart. Like I had a birthday a few days ago, and I got this, I should actually write a blog post about this because I was really annoyed. I got a birthday greeting from BMW. Now, my relationship with BMW is not like, I was surprised that they knew my birthday. I guess they know because when you go there, they photocopy your driver's uh, license. But I felt that that was a violation of my privacy because this person doesn't send me anything, like, I accept a birthday greeting that's generic. And I just felt that, hey, like, if you're going to send something, then maybe a card would have been better. But why are you using this information that I didn't specifically give you to provide information to me? So, I mean, so you need to use your judgment, but certainly a personal touch is uh, a great approach to use. Uh, so, 
there is information online, and I've got lots of other presentations, video, handouts, etc., that you can go to that talk about other forms of social media. So in terms of a summary, if you look at LinkedIn, it's an opportunity for you to stand out because it's a tool that is available, it's free, other people are using it. And so while trust may be low in our sector, it can certainly be high for you. Thank you. Uh, I thought that was great. Uh, I've got a few comments that I just wanted to make before we break for our networking break. A um, couple of things that I've learned this morning from our first two speakers, Matthew and Promote. Both of them talked about building trust on a long-term basis, and both of them kind of had a theme of the little things add up and, go, and can definitely go a long way. Whether, we, whether you talk about the the regular occurrence of, of putting your knowledge out there that Promote's talking about, or making these deposits in the trust bank that Matthew's talking about, it's the same idea to me. Um, and some of that, of proving that you're constantly improving to the potential prospects out there, made me think of a, of a phrase that's, that a industry veteran said to me five, 10 years ago, where, where they said, what you always wanna do is prove that you have 20 years experience, not one year experience 20 times, yeah. right? And anybody can be around, I've been in the industry 17 years, doesn't necessarily mean that I have 17 years experience unless I can demonstrate it, that it's not, one year experience 17 times. Um, when Promote mentioned the, the the mega company compliance regimes on social media, as somebody who used to be at a, at a mega company, I can tell you that um, I mean, the example that he used of not being allowed to speak nicely of somebody else is a little, a little odd, but I, I think the problem in our industry is that the compliance regimes of the mega companies are forced to deal with the 1% that ruin it for the rest of us that end up creating these problems that promote open with of the financial industry is the least trusted in, in a lot of people's minds, right? So again, it, it is the 1% that ruins it for the rest of us. And the more that we can do to flush those people out of the industry, the better off we all are. Um, last thing, I've got a couple to do's. Um, I need to be more open with giving people that I trust testimonials and I need to finish the rest of my LinkedIn profile. So. I got some homework to do.